this program, we are concentrating mainly upon the exploration of Venus. But first of all, our news notes. Chris, uh, a new solar probe, well, two new solar probes. That's right. I'm delighted to report two successful launches. Solar B, which is now called Hanodi, that's a Japanese probe with some British instruments on board, and NASA's Stereo, which should provide our first ever 3D images of material coming off the sun and heading towards the Earth. Both probes are up and working well. Something very interesting, we have a green comet, Comet Swan, which became visible with the naked eye, though it's now fading paying its one and only visit to the sun. Yes, and it surprised us on its way past. It suddenly brightened and, in fact, was easily visible with the naked eye from a dark site, although it was very low from the UK. It was a beautiful comet, a long tail, and this strange green colour, which is clearly visible in photographs. It's still there in the constellation of Hercules, and you should still find it with binoculars, so make the best of it. You will never see it again. Now, back to my own particular province, the moon. As you know, there were reports of ice inside lunar craters, and I was a total sceptic from the world goes. It can't possibly be there. And news out now indicate it almost certainly is not. What they found was hydrogen, probably from the solar wind. But there are no skating leaks on the moon. No, it's a rather a shame, actually. I quite fancied skating on the moon. And we should talk about another debate that's been going on for years. Are there lakes on the surface of Titan, that Saturn's largest moon, shrouded in a thick methane atmosphere where the Huygens probe landed just a couple of years ago? And it turns out there actually are lakes. These images, taken from Huygens' mothership, the Cassini spacecraft, show dark areas. And they're clearly lakes. They have river channels running into them, and they're flat. Their radar bounces straight off them. And those are bodies of liquid on the surface. Now, what liquid they are, exactly. we don't know. It Chemical. could be, it's certainly not water. It's something, a heavy chemical, either methane or ethane, uh, most likely. But we won't know that for a while. Further studies needed, and Cassini's flying past Titan uh, over the next few months to try and get better images. Cassini had been a real triumph. And then, again, near home, Mars, the optimality probe. It's now travelled nearly six miles since landing. It's got to the rim of Victoria Crater and has been photographed on the surface by MRO, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. This is, I think, the most amazing picture yet. There's Victoria Crater and there is the probe. It's incredible, is it? You have to remember these things are about the size of a car and yet not only can we see the probe, we can see its tracks in the sand and we can see the shadow of the mast which supports its main camera. And look at the crater itself. There's a huge amount of exposed bedrock here and this is a gold mine for geologists. Up to you have been working for far longer than expected. Yes, both Opportunity and its twin, Spirit, are now approaching the thousand-day mark, mm -hmm. and they're only expected to last for 90 days. They're incredible probes. They really are incredible probes, and after all, Mars is such a fascinating world. And one remarkable, variable star. Yes, this is a unique object, V838 Mon, and it's a star which suddenly became something like 20 to 30,000 times brighter than it had been, just for an instant. And the light produced in that remarkable flare-up has been propagating outwards and illuminating the dust which surrounds the star. And we've been watching this with the Hubble Space Telescope since about 2002. Yes. And in the sequence of images, you can actually see the light illuminating successive shells of dust, and two new ones have been added to the sequence. And it really is quite a remarkably beautiful object. Then it's only to see things actually happening, and this is one case. Absolutely. And yet we still don't know what caused the star at the centre to flare up. No, we certainly did. Let's get even further away to your premise, Chris, um, colliding galaxies. Yes, there are some rather nice stories here this month. There are the antennae galaxies. Oh, yes. Now, this is the classic local example yes. of two large galaxies which are just colliding. And Hubble has captured this amazing image showing the chaos that's ensuing. We should say, though, that when two galaxies collide, individual stars don't hit each other. They're too far apart for that. But the gas does interact, and it's that which triggers this star formation. And the reason that events like this are important is because this is how we think all galaxies form, by building up from little blocks, small galaxies in the very early universe. And this Hubble photo of what's been called the Spider Galaxy shows exactly that process. 
Hubble can still produce results unlike those from any other telescope. And the great news is that the Space Shuttle will be returning to Hubble in 2008. Before this decision was made, we thought the telescope had at most two years of life left. But now, the astronauts will be able to make essential repairs and fit two new instruments. And that should allow the telescope to continue producing pictures well into the next decade. And now, uh, planets of other stars. Exciting developments there, Chris. Yes, it's probably the most rapidly moving area of astronomy. And to catch up on the latest results, I talked to Andy Norton of the Open University. Back in 2004, I visited SuperWASP on the island of La Palma in the Canaries. Its bank of cameras sweep the sky, looking for the tiny signatures that indicate the presence of an extrasolar planet. All of these planets are too small and too faint to be detected directly, so instead we use two indirect methods. The first is to look for the wobble of the star as it's pulled by the planet's gravity, and the other, used by SuperWASP, is to look for a transit, the faint dip in light seen on the star as the planet passes in front of it. It's an incredibly small effect, and so it's a real technical challenge for the SuperWASP team to spot these faint signatures of the presence of planets. We literally go across the whole sky, we can do, uh, taking images again and again. We detect maybe 100,000 stars in a given snapshot, and we just take repeated snapshots throughout the night, and then we go away, extract the light curves from all the stars in these, in these images, put them into our archive and then search for the transits in the archive data. And there's so much data that that's actually a really difficult task. Absolutely. Um, our first run on this was in 2004 with the system in La Palma, just with five cameras. <clears throat> and even that, we generated light curves of 6.7 million objects containing, I think it's 14 billion data points. So the, the brightest and, and best sampled of those light curves, about a million stars, We've now run searches on those looking for transits in those million light curves and the hundred best of those that we found look like plausible exoplanet transits and from that hundred we found our first two genuine extrasolar planets. The needles in the haystack. Absolutely, yeah. And there'll, there'll be many more to come. We're, we're absolutely convinced of that. But these are the first two that we've just found. Well, let's talk about exoplanets in general. I said we've now found over 200. Mm -hmm. What are they like? Well, the majority of them are Jupiter-like planets, merely because they're the easiest ones to find. They're the most massive. And more often than not, we're finding hot Jupiters, Jupiter-sized planets in close-in orbits. Again, because they're the easiest ones to find. But now we know of planets with orbits anything from less than a day to 10 years or so. So we're beginning to find Jupiter-like planets in Jupiter-like orbits, if you like. We're also beginning to find uh, lower mass planets. I think the, the lowest mass planet now confirmed is something like five and a half times the Earth's mass. It's about the same as Neptune. Uh, well, a, li a little less, perhaps, but that, that, that's the smallest, the smallest planet we, we find. Up to the, the most massive planet, I suppose, is, is round about the, uh, the brown dwarf limit, 12 or 13 Jupiter masses. One of the few th things that's coming out of this is that where we find planets, it tends to be round stars with higher metallicities, higher proportions of elements other than uh, hydrogen and helium. And that's presumably as you might expect, because if there are those heavier elements there, you could imagine that gives the material from which planets are formed. And that does seem to be held up. Well, what can we say about conditions and the planets themselves? Do we know about temperatures, for example? Well. These hot Jupiters, they're obviously very, very close to their, to their host stars, much closer, for instance, than the planet Mercury is, is to the Sun. They go around typically in just a few days. So they are indeed heated. Um, one of the WASP planets is, uh, we've measured the mass of it, and it's something like 80 to 90 percent that of Jupiter. We've measured the radius, and it's 20 or 30 percent bigger than Jupiter. So the idea there is that the extreme temperatures are somehow inflating the planet and possibly driving off some of the atmosphere, and that's probably fairly common. It's been called the cork planet because its density is so low. That's right. It's a very, very low density planet, and, and a lot of these close-in hot Jupiters seem to be uh, that low density. Well, the more we discover, the less we seem to actually understand about these things. What do you think happens next? We're going to find a lot more with WASP, that's for sure. Uh, with WASP, we, we will probably find all of the bright host stars that have, uh, have exoplanets. We should be sensitive to find everything brighter than magnitude 14 over the whole sky. So we'll find 100, a couple of hundred probably with WASP, and then that will lead the way into these satellite missions, which should find even more. And in a few years' time, I'm sure we'll be detecting 
Earth mass, Earth type planets around some of these stars as well. And then we can find out how unique our own solar system is. That will be the interesting thing, won't it? And, and who knows, looking for signs of life as well in the spectral signatures from the planets. Andy, thank you very much. Thank you. And now on to our main programme, the planet Venus. What do we know and what did we know about it? Well, first of all, in size and mass, Venus and Earth are almost twins. Venus is very slightly smaller, very slightly less massive, but nothing very much. It's closer to the Sun than we are, only 67 million miles out, as against our 93 million. And it goes around in less than 225 days, so a very short year, but a very long day. Venus spins slowly, to 243 days to turn around once, and from our point of view, the wrong way. Just why that is so, we don't know. We can't see the surface. It's covered by a dense, cloudy atmosphere, and telescopes won't see through it. Therefore, look at Venus, all you see is the characteristic phase. So we just did not know. Now, we've really started to find out. Welcome to our two guests, Professor Fred Taylor and Dr. David Rothley. Welcome to the Sky at Night. May I come to you first, Fred, please? Um, Venus Express, can you give us a rundown? Yes, uh, Venus Express arrived at the planet in April. Uh, it's now got into its final orbit, which is a process that takes several months. It's not a lander, of course. It's not a lander. It's orbiting Venus. It's orbiting very close over the North Pole and a long way away from the South Pole. So it's a very eccentric orbit, which gives us full-scale views of Venus from near the South Pole yes. and very close-up views from the North Pole. And uh, its job is to study the atmosphere of Venus primarily. We're, try we're trying to understand why Venus has such a strange and extreme climate. And we're trying to understand the way the atmosphere behaves in terms of meteorological phenomena. You can just see the tops of the clouds, of course. Uh, no, these days we can see deep into the clouds and all the way down to the surface. So this is one of the things that's new about the Venus Express payload. We've got advanced techniques now. Yeah. So the old days when we were stuck at looking at the tops of the clouds and the atmosphere above that uh, have, have gone and we're now penetrating down through the clouds. We're seeing new kinds of clouds deep in the atmosphere and we're seeing the behavior of the atmosphere all the way down to the surface. What about the clouds themselves? Well, we know that the top layer of clouds is made of concentrated sulfuric acid. It's very, Not very, nice. very nasty stuff, no? Very, very corrosive and uh, remarkable. Do you get sulfuric acid rain? Uh, no, I think it's too hot for that. Uh, what we observe is that there are no clouds at all below a height of about uh, 27 or 28 kilometers above the surface. The lower atmosphere seems to be relatively clear. And the reason for that is that it's just so hot, it evaporates everything. So there may be rain in the middle part of the atmosphere, but it, it evaporates before it reaches the surface. And the surface is fairly clear. Yes, uh, the visibility down there may not be too bad, although, of course, the atmosphere is so dense that you get a tremendous sort of mirage effect. If you were on the day side, you'd be able to look around and it would be illuminated by the sun. And if you looked up, you'd be able to see the sun's disk very dimly through the clouds because the sunlight does mm. penetrate the clouds. What about the atmospheric pressure on the surface? It's nearly a hundred times the pressure on the Earth. This is, this is what makes Venus such a remarkable place. It's interesting, actually, if you just consider the top half of the Venus atmosphere down to about the cloud top level, it's actually quite a lot like Earth's atmosphere because the pressure at the cloud tops is yes. roughly the pressure at the surface of the Earth. And the temperature is more or less the same as well. It's actually a little bit lower than the Earth. So we've got a sort of Earth-type, Earth-like atmosphere sitting on top of this great thick, deep atmosphere, which is in some ways more like an ocean than an atmosphere. There have, of course, been many earlier probes. Um, the very successful Magellan of 1990. Magellan was uh, a, an American probe which used very high-resolution radar to image the surface, uh, showing details smaller than 100 metres across in many cases, and it produced pretty much global mapping. And for, for a very long time, radar was the only real way we had of seeing down to the surface, and it's still the most detailed way we have of, of, of imaging the surface. And it showed us a world that's distressingly unlike the Earth. Yes. It, it, Venus, one would think, would be geologically the same as the Earth. It's the same size, mass and density, but it just doesn't it work It should that be, way. it just doesn't. And it revealed uh, volcanoes, it revealed extensive lava fields, large areas of fractured surface, some areas where mountain belts have been folded up. There are impact craters scattered around, but not very many. That's how we know that the average age of Venus's surface is nothing like as old as the Moon, for example. There's geology going on. There's something to erase the ancient record of impact cratering. And there are uh, isolated mountains of conical shape with features radiating away from them, which can hardly be anything other than lava flows. And there are deep valleys, too. There are valleys which are fractures, yes. where the surface has been pulled apart tectonically. There are also some gully-like erosional valleys. 
um, which we really don't understand at all. A thousand kilometres long, snaky little little gullies across the surface, which must have been cut by some flowing fluid, but, but not water. What fluid do you think? Lava? Some people think water a long time ago, but that's uh, a bit far-fetched, possibly. Uh, uh, yes, it has to be uh, l lava, but lava on the Earth doesn't do that. It has to be a special kind of runny lava, doesn't yes. it? Mm. Uh, that, you know, something that can stay liquid for a very, very long time, because these things are deep and they're very, very long, as they've said. It certainly isn't a friendly place, but um, I remember the time when we thought that Venus might be more promising than Mars. Do you remember that? Mm. It, oh. should, it should have a balmy climate. I mean, that, those expectations that everybody had before the high temperatures were discovered were actually quite reasonable. Because although Venus is closer to the sun, because it's so cloudy, it reflects a lot of the sunlight away and is actually heated less by the sun than the Earth is. So it was not unreasonable uh, to think that it might be you know, just, just a, a very Earth-like place. Arrhenius, um, the slant of Arrhenius, but the idea it might be a kind of carboniferous world. Yes, yes indeed, and that, and that was very reasonable. And we, but now we know it isn't, so we've got to discover why. And the basic reason is that it's just got so much more atmosphere than anybody thought. I think we all assumed that the surface pressure would be not too different from the Earth. I mean, not exactly the same, of course. But I remember, too, the Whipple-Menzel theory. The Venus had mainly covered with water. Yes. Well, Venus has lost its water. It would originally have had much the same amount of water that the Earth has, but Venus, because it began to get hot, more and more water evaporated, and it's almost all escaped to space. There's some in the atmosphere, none on the surface. And we can tell this by measuring the amount of heavy hydrogen in the atmosphere compared to ordinary hydrogen. That tells us that hydrogen has escaped. So the water evaporated, got broken down by sunlight into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen leaked away, and we've got a dry planet now. No chance for water to have now survived. Now, why did that happen so markedly on Venus and not here, luckily? It's something called the, the greenhouse effect. Venus was a little bit closer to the sun, so it got warmer, and once the process begins, it gets a chance to, to, to run away. And that's, that's why all the carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere as well, because the water is gone. There's no chance to draw the carbon down as carbonate to form limestone rocks that we have on the Earth. So it's all down to the greenhouse effect. Had we been 20 million miles closer in, that would have happened here. It might have, yes, so, because there are other differences between Venus and Earth. And one is that Venus rotates very slowly and mm -hmm. has no magnetic field. And this makes a big difference to the way the atmosphere is stripped away at the top. And so there are other reasons why Venus could lose its water more easily than the Earth, in addition to the extra heating from the sun. Are there active volcanoes there now, do you think? There are spaces where volcanism could be going on today, relatively recent volcanism. And I'm well, waiting for well, Fred well, to tell us because he's looking at the atmosphere we're trying and to we find want out. to know, well, yes, is there some is. fresh volcanic gas What there? about the increase of sulfur dioxide? There was a great burst in about 1978, I think. Yes, that, that's quite convincing. Uh, I mean, volcanoes would do that. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that some other kind of changes in the chemistry or meteorology of the atmosphere would do that as well, so we've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, but Venus Express was designed to probe down near the surface and measure the gases, the trace gases in the atmosphere, and we're seeing lots of interesting things down there. And what we've got to do is look for evidence of that gas coming out of volcanoes. For example, if there was a big plume of sulfur dioxide originating in a large surface feature that looked like a volcano, that would be pretty convincing. Dave, on the surface, um, the Russians got the first pictures active from the surface. Yeah, they had um, landers in the mid-70s up to the very early 80s, which got some very distorted-looking images, or so they seemed at first. They came down and actually sent back pictures from the surface. Oh, yes. They sent back pictures from the region, more or less in the middle of the globe over there, yeah. uh, Phoebe Regio, and um, they showed a region of, of, of slabby rocks at the foot of the lander, stuff like this. This is, this is oh, yes. sort of what the rocks might be. It's, it, this is a piece of basalt from, from yes. Mount Etna on the Earth. We think the Venus surface composition is pretty much like this, and the rocks that we see on the lander images are rather like this, scattered across well, we a, did a, a volcanic Well, we did a Sky at Night programme when they first came down, of course, but they've now had another look at the pictures. Yeah, the pictures that you could see were very grainy. They've now been reprocessed, so you can see lots of shades of grey, and the, the geometry has been changed. The original scanner would look up to the left, down like this, and up to the horizon yes. over there. And we used to forget the horizon. It would just be a little corner bit yes. of the pictures. And a very talented computer engineer called Don Mitchell has reprocessed these images and stitched them together so we can see the horizon all the way around. And, and we can now look to the horizon on Venus and see the hills in the distance and get a real feeling of, of depth. So you have a, a barren, rock-strewn plain stretching away to a, not a 
terribly rugged landscape, but a landscape with some topography and some depth to it. And I think these reprocessed images give us a, a real new insight about what it would be like to stand on the surface. I remember one of the Russians telling me that the light level there was about the same as that at noon in Moscow on the cloudy <laughs> winter day. Yes, which, which is quite bright. I will remember my first view of those pictures from Venus. I was absolutely thrilled. It never struck me we'd be able to get those in my lifetime. Good evening. Last month was one of the most exciting in the whole story of space research. The Russians soft landed two probes on Venus and got back the first pictures from the surface of that extraordinary planet. And incredible pictures they are. So well, let's begin with the very first one, the picture of the surface of Venus from Venera 9. And uh, frankly, when I first saw that, I just couldn't credit it. There at the bottom, that um, semicircular thing is part of the spacecraft, and the rocks are very clearly displayed all around it. Of course, we um, followed the Venus missions very closely. And in 1968, when the landers came down, the Russians sent us a very interesting film, came through from the USSR Academy of Sciences. Well, what do you think of it? Well, it's a remarkable engineering feat to actually land on Venus under the extreme conditions there. And of course, in those days, nobody was actually sure what the Venus conditions were. No. So they had to make this enormous pressure vessel with, the, with these huge bolts and thick walls, and they had to make it out of something that wouldn't melt before it had landed and made its measurements. And it's intriguing to see them working on it, especially with the technology that looks so old-fashioned now, but was so advanced for the time. Were they still expecting to hit water at the time? Oh, this, this no, no, I don't think so. I think they no. just wanted to uh, not break it. Yeah, to not break. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that should have gone off sooner, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and of course, they didn't know what the pressure was. No. When, with the early probe, so we knew by then that the surface was hot. It wasn't known then that that was due to the very high pressure. And, of course, engineering something for a pressure of 100 atmospheres requires something very substantial. Nothing survives for very long. Even the Russian landers, which worked extremely well on the surface, only did so for less than an hour. And that, of course, is because of the high temperature. They sit there and they warm up, and eventually the electronics just fail, because we don't know how to make electronics that work at those temperatures. We well, still don't to this day. Always amazed me that the Russians had such great success at Venus, and absolutely none with Mars. <laughs> Mars seems to be more difficult. Every, everybody's had more trouble at Mars, the Americans also. Yeah. Uh, and the a lot of, well, yes. Well, Venus Express is now in orbit around Venus and sending back results. Anything startling in you so far? Well, the, the thing that startles me is the appearance of the polar vortex. We expect one because of the high winds and the motions towards the pole. But when you look at it in detail, uh, it doesn't look like an ordinary vortex. Uh, what we might have expected is a sort of whirlpool-type structure, rather like a terrestrial hurricane, which indeed is what it is. Uh, but it has a remarkable double structure. We, we call it the Venus dipole. Why? Because instead of having one eye at the center, like, a, like the hurricanes we're used to, it has two eyes. And these are revolving around the pole like this, thousands of miles apart. And the air seems to be descending, in, not at the center, but in these, in these two counter-rotating regions. So it's a double vortex, if you like. It's like a double-eyed hurricane. And uh, this double aspect and all these details that we see in this kind of image are what's fascinating us and, and frankly, puzzling us at the moment. One advantage of Venus Express is that as well as working at visible wavelengths, it can also go down to the ultraviolet. Yes, that's right. This is one of the ultraviolet pictures from Venus Express that we're looking at here during the approach sequence to the planet. Uh, it's been known for a long time, I think since the 1930s, that if you look at Venus through an ultraviolet filter, markings appear in the clouds that are not apparent to the naked eye. I've done that myself. Yes, indeed. And uh, these are very interesting. They, sh they show, first of all, the meteorology in the yes. atmosphere. We can see these, this is how we know there are high winds on Venus. The reason the markings are there is that there's a, a mystery absorber, if you like, distributed among the Venus clouds in an uneven way. And uh, this is some product of the cloud chemistry that we don't yet understand. We thought there were a very slow rotation. The meteorology of Venus ought to be simple. It certainly isn't. You would think so, wouldn't you? On a slowly turning planet, you might expect low winds, instead of which they're much higher than they are on the Earth. Right. So these winds are racing along uh, at quite a high pressure, the sort of, as I say, the sort of pressure we have on the surface of the Earth. And they're about 60 times faster than the rotation yes. of the planet, circulating the whole globe. So something's got to drive winds like that, and uh, understanding what that is, is, is one of our goals. 
Then we come to what we call the ash and light. When the moon is a crescent, the dark side, not lit by the sun, is seen shining faintly. No mystery about that. Light reflected onto the moon by the Earth, we call it the Earth shine. But you get the same kind of thing on Venus. When the Venus is crescent, you can see the dark side shining faintly. And we call it the ash and light. And that can't be reflection because Venus has no moon, and the Earth certainly couldn't do it. No, it, it's clearly a real phenomenon because it's been observed for centuries. The first observation of the ashen light on Venus was, was made in 1643. That's an amazing thing, really, for a phenomenon that's uh, really quite faint. Franz von Bollegeist, the German astronomer, uh, he believed that the, the ashen light was caused by uh, illuminations lit by the Venusians. Well, um, I think we discount that. Well, that would do it, but it doesn't seem very likely, does no. it? <laughs> The, uh, the effect that we're seeing with Venus Express is, is just thermal emission. The, the surface of Venus is actually glowing. So you asked me earlier what Venus would be like if you were standing on the surface. If you were standing on the night side, it wouldn't be dark. You, there'd be a dull red glow from all of your surroundings just because it's so hot. It's actually dull red hot. The glow from the surface is passing through the clouds and the spacecraft is observing it and it produces a pattern very much like your drawings of the ashen light. So what I think is happening is that when your eye is nicely dark attuned and you're out there um, looking at uh, the dark side of Venus through your telescope, you're actually seeing the glow from the surface through the clouds. And the reason that you see it as a pattern is the actual structure of the clouds forming a, a variable obscuration across the disk. That certainly seems the best idea so far, don't you agree, Dave? I think it's feasible, and some people see it and some don't, I understand, and we're right at the edge of sensitivity of human yes. eyesight, aren't when, we? When you do the sums, it's just on the margin of being detectable, so that would explain why some people see it and some don't, perhaps. Well, Venus Express is there, going round and round, sending back data. How long is it going to last? It's scheduled to last for 500 Earth days, which is approximately two Venus years, just a little more than two Venus years. But we're already planning an extended mission if things are still going well at the end of two Venus years, right to early 2009. What do you expect from it, David? Well, what I hope for, which is not necessarily what I expect, is that <laughs> seeing through the clouds at the right wavelength towards the surface, I'd like to see a new lava field. I'd like to see a red-hot lava field that's just been emplaced. Then we'd know that volcanism is going on. It's unlikely that we'd be that lucky, but that, for me, would be a tremendous find for Venus Express. Well, just one last question to you both. Uh, first of all, uh, David, are there going to be any more landers? On Venus, eventually, yes. yes, it's a big technological challenge. Europe um, is fairly clearly going to concentrate on Mars in the next 20 years. Yes. Venus is not a priority. Eventually, there'll be landers, maybe with balloon craft, low in the atmosphere, rather than attempting to land straight away. But obviously, we will carry on exploring Venus. What do you think about that? Mm, I agree with David. And I've actually just been working with ESA on an advanced study of a mission that might be carried out in about 10 years' time, and this is to actually not only land on Venus, but to drill down into the surface and collect a core sample and bring it back to the Earth. Well, it's all very exciting. And Venus, the planet of mystery, is still mysterious in some ways, not the kind of world we thought it was. David, Fred, thank you very much. Next month, when I come back, we're going much further out, and I'm going to talk about the sounds of the stars. Until then, good night. Thank you.